can turn to Psalm 66, and that will be our scripture reading this morning. Before we do that, I just want to welcome you to First Baptist Church here in Marshall. If you are a guest with us today, we ask you just one thing. In the pew, somewhere near you, there will be one of these called a Connect card. If you could just fill one of those out, drop it either in the offering plate or take it to one of our ushers at the back on your way out. They have a welcome packet for you with lots of information about the church. But if you can fill that out, I promise we won't spam you, but this just makes it really easy for us to follow up with you and see if we can pray for any of your needs. With that said, let's take a look at Psalm 66, 1 through 6. The psalmist writes, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name. Come and see the works of God, who is awesome in his deeds toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There, let us rejoice in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day in your house, Lord. And uh, we can come and worship you and focus upon you. And uh, Lord, I pray that um, you would move in a mighty way during this service. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Let's continue to worship, Brother Carl. <laughs>
kids here. Children's Church this has already started. You guys go ahead and go. <laughs> so um, let's pray. Uh, if you have a bulletin in the back of the bulletin, there's a lot of people that have prayed for. So let's just bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the wonderful just weather we've been having, just time you've given us to come freely together to worship and praise you. Just ask that you, uh, as we give this offering, just bless the gift and the giver. And just also for those who are just struggling to give, as they just give to you spiritually by being here and just worshiping and praising you and just following you. And just be with those who have lost uh, loved ones uh, in these past several weeks. Again, we just... We know that you are the God of the universe, and we just thank you for the love that you have shown us. And just so I also want to lift up Chuck, uh, Pastor Chuck, to you, and just and say you just pour your spirit on him, and just to uh, give the message you want us to hear today. We ask in your son's name. Amen. <laughs> Uh, 
I missed the sign that day. Oftentimes, that happens with the text that we're going to be in this morning. Right? We're going to be looking at Jesus turning water into wine. And many times this discussion just talks about, well, should we drink? Shouldn't we drink? What was the content of the wine? What did it look like? And all these other kind of questions. The problem is it completely misses the point of the passage. Okay? I don't want us to end up in Emporia this morning. Okay? All right? I want us to get this text right. So let's take a look this morning at this text. Because John, later in this very gospel, says in verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 31, he says this. He says, But these I have written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the reason that John wrote his gospel. He curated, if you will, some of the most important miracles and signs that Jesus did in his life, his earthly ministry so that we would learn from them, that they would point us to belief in him and thus eternal life. So if we get this text wrong, that's not a good thing. Amen? Okay. With that said, let's read starting in verse 1 down through verse 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing twenty or thirty gallons each. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we ask that you speak to our hearts this morning through your word. Lord, please illuminate our minds, open our hearts. And as we seek you this morning, we ask that you would transform us. It's in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So as we look at this sign, we need to break it down a little bit, okay? So let's break down this, uh, this sign, this event, this miracle of Jesus. First, I want you to see this morning the setting of the sign, okay? The setting. Uh, it says, on the third day, they were in a wedding in Cana of Galilee, all right? And Cana of Galilee was a very small town about nine miles north of Nazareth. Now, if you know anything about Nazareth, I think its highest population in Jesus' day was roughly 500 people. Okay, so any people from Norburn here this morning? Okay, about that size, right? So a small town, about 500 people, uh, but but maybe even less at this time. Uh, um, But nine miles north of that was this town, Cana, and it was even smaller, right? And so, uh, this is the site for this miracle. And we need to understand that weddings were a huge social event in the first century. Even more so than today. There was much more involved, they were much longer, and entire communities were often present. And um, they could take up to a week long. There were large celebrations, and what we need to understand as well is that the groom was responsible for paying the festivities, right? So the groom is responsible, and this was after a year betrothal or engagement period in our vernacular, and they would prepare a place for their bride. They would oftentimes build on to the family home a place for their bride, and um, they would also get all of the supplies needed for this wedding celebration. And this was one way of showing your father-in-law that you could take care of his daughter, Okay? And so, on the wedding, on the night of the ceremony, the the biggest night, likely Wednesday, the groom and his friends would then go out to the house of the bride, escort her and her attendants to the groom's house, 
for a ceremony and a banquet. And this is the setting here. At the end of this celebration, the marriage would be consummated and would be completed. And more than likely, this wedding was probably for relatives of Jesus and his family. Okay? It seems here in the text that Mary uh, is more than just simply a guest. Okay? That she is in charge of something related to the wedding. And so this is the setting, this massive cultural event, the, the, this large spread, the city is there, and Jesus is present, and he is here, and he's about to step out of his private 30 years and step into his public years of ministry. So that's number one. Secondly, I want us to see the situation of the sign, the situation. Verse 3, it says, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. That is a little confusing. This little conversation seems a little broken in our, uh, uh, our way of speaking. So let's break this down as well. Well, for one, wine was a staple drink in the first century. Okay, It was a staple drink in the ancient Near East. And you either drink water or you drink some form of wine, okay? And water could be a problem because oftentimes it wasn't clean and you may have stomach issues, okay? Wine was a problem because of the problem of fermentation, right? No refrigeration. And if you leave wine to itself, it's going to ferment. And the problem with fermentation is if you overindulge in wine, you could get drunk, which the Bible does explicitly say is a sin. And so they would often dilute wine by mixing it with at least three parts of water to one part wine. Number one, it would taste a little sweet. Number two, it would be a little easier on your stomach. And so oftentimes they would do this to avoid drunkenness. But a crisis here appears at this celebration. The wine ran out. And this not only would open the, the, new, couple, the new couple to public shame and scrutiny, and especially the groom, because he was supposed to have everything he needed to pull this off. It was not a good look. On top of that, you can be sued by the bride's family. Okay? That's not a great way to start off with your in-laws. Okay? Right? We do not want that. Uh, and and you, you thought your in-laws were bad. If they were suing you immediately because you did not provide to get there and to redeem their money, that would be an issue. So what does Mary do? Well, Mary goes to Jesus. At this time, Joseph is likely dead. And Jesus, being the oldest, is the man of the house. And... He goes to her. Also, can you think about this? If Jesus ever gave his mom uh, uh, advice, he never steered her wrong. Think about that. He always sent her in the right direction. And she was aware who he is. She was aware of his virgin birth. She was aware of her conversation with Gabriel, obviously. She was aware of the visit from the Magi. She had heard the declaration of Simeon, and, and she had witnessed the sinless life of her son firsthand. And she goes to him, seemingly asking him to do something to help out this family member in need. And Jesus responds with, woman, what does that have to do with us? Now, I tell you, that sounds very rude in our day, does it not? I don't typically say to my wife, Alicia, woman, right? <laughs> not if I don't want to get stabbed, okay? <laughs> That's not how you talk to your wife, right? Now, we need to understand here, it's, it's hard to translate this word into our vernacular. Really, it's more like madam is what Jesus is saying. Okay, so he says, Madam, what does that have to do with us? Now, this does, this does signify distancing of their relationship. This is a change in the relationship of Jesus with his mother. And uh, he says, what does this have to do with us? He's rhetorically asking what the two parties have in common. This phrase was used to put distance between he and Mary. And Jesus here is declaring that his public ministry had begun and therefore their relationship had now changed. You see, Mary was no longer to relate to Jesus as her son, but rather as her Savior. Okay? She was now to relate to him as her Savior, the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus was reminding her here that He 
is in fact the Messiah. And uh, in a human sense, they were related, but in another sense, they could not be more different. And he says here, my hour has not yet come. And Jesus uses that term here, my hour, is referring to his sacrificial death on the cross. And even here, Jesus knows the purpose for which he came. He's just saying this is not the time. Uh, John 7, 30, we read, so they were seeking to seize Jesus and no man laid his hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Jesus was on a divine timetable. He had an earthly ministry, and he was beginning that earthly ministry. However, his sacrificial death was not at this time. And he was stepping out, as I said, from private into public. And this miracle would preview the hour, but it was not the hour. And so Mary understood this, and, and Jesus, what Jesus was saying, she didn't act offended. We get no sense here that she's upset by what Jesus says. And, and rather, she tells the servants to do whatever the Messiah says. Do whatever he says to do. And so this is the issue. This is the crisis point. And this leads us to the third thing I want you to see this morning. I want you to see the supply of the sign. Look with me at verse 6. It says, Now there were six stone water pots set there for Jewish custom of purification, containing twenty or thirty gallons each. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now, take it to the head waiter. And so they took it to him. And the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said, Most people set out the good wine first. You've kept it to the end. You've kept the good wine until now. So let's think about this here. We have these stone water pots. There's 20 to 30 gallons each in each of them. So 20 to 30 gallons of liquid. So we're talking somewhere between, uh, we're probably talking around 240 pounds of liquid in each one of those. Okay? And these were used by devout Jews at the time for what they thought was ritual purification. They would wash their hands before courses. They would wash their utensils. They would wash their plates. And the reason for this is because they thought if they ate on a dirty piece of silverware that they would become ceremonially unclean. And so this was part of this sacrificial system, sort of this, part of this old covenant, part of this uh, tradition added on to the Word of God. And Jesus says here, fill those to the brim with water. And then he performs this miracle, transforming the water into wine. And it's important to note here that this large amount of wine uh, was more than enough to finish the wedding celebration and likely was a great wedding gift to the couple. Okay, It was more than was needed to complete the wedding. And it was likely a gift to the newlywed couple. They could sell the remaining for money, for anything they might need. And Jesus says, now take it to the head waiter. And uh, when he sampled it, he's astonished at the quality of the wine. And Jesus had miraculously here, out of nothing, produced a wine better than that had been at the wedding. Now, oftentimes we just move on and say, wow, what a cool miracle. And, uh, or we get in, we devolve into conversations of what was the content of the wine, you know, uh, and, and this and that. But remember, these are written that we may believe. This is the purpose for which John wrote it down, the reason that he recorded it in his gospel. And so I want us to see this morning the significance of the sign. The significance of the sign. Verse 11 says, This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So what does this sign point to? Well, first, it points to the identity of Christ. It points to the identity of Christ. This miracle is a creative miracle. One that, that, that basically uh, time does not, Jesus does not conform to time, right? He creatively brings about this wine. Typically wine comes from a vine 
and it's fruit of the vine. It comes from seeds, which come from another vine, right? And Jesus here does this in an instant. He brings about this wine. Now think about this in the context of the Gospel of John. In verse 1-1 in this Gospel, John says that Jesus was with God in the beginning and what? Was God. And here we see the creative work of God in the flesh. John is also the one who said this in verse 3 of chapter 1. He says, all things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. You see, Jesus is the creator God. He has power over nature, over time, over all creation, because it is his, and he is creator God. And this sign points to his deity. What man could do such a thing? Well, friends, no mere man, but rather the God-man, the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. And so the significance of this sign is first and foremost that it points to who he is as our Savior. Secondly, though, it also points to his death on the cross. It points to his death on the cross. You see, Jesus here is pointing to the ultimate purification of our sins. Okay? You say, Pastor Chuck, how? Well, notice that he did not say, bring me the wine vats and fill those with water. And replenish those. What did he fill? He brought the purification pots that the Jews relied on to be ceremonially clean, to put the new wine of the gospel within those vessels. You see? He didn't fill up the wine vats, he filled up the purification jars. Jesus is saying that through his sacrificial death on the cross, he will make a final, permanent purification for sins. Not one that's just washing of hands, but one, friends, that changes hearts from the inside out. He's saying, I am bringing a new covenant. One that transforms a person, a permanent cleanness before God. Not based on works, but based on his sacrificial death and resurrection. He points to removing the outward rituals of Judaism that cannot save a person and replacing it with the new wine of the gospel. And the pots once used for ceremonial washing have been transformed instead into vessels of joy and vessels of Abundance. We see Jesus speak this way later in John's Gospel in chapter 6, verse 53 through 55. Jesus says here symbolically, he says, So he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And so we see Jesus use this language. And he's not saying literally eat his flesh, literally drink his blood. He's saying figuratively, come to me, come to me, and I will save you. And here, by this miracle, Jesus is making a statement of who he is and why he came and where he's headed. Third, it points to our failure and his sufficiency. It points to our failure. And his sufficiency. Who did the head waiter call once he tasted the wine? Well, he calls over the bridegroom. And he says, where did this come from? Nobody does this. But you see, the bridegroom had failed to have enough supply. He had failed to have enough for this event. And friends, all of us have failed to live up to the glory of God. All of us have fallen short. We cannot in our own strength get to heaven. We cannot do enough good works. We cannot be a good enough person to get to heaven. We need a Savior who died in our place, who imputes and gives His righteousness to us, one that we could not do. He has offered to give to us freely when we trust Him by faith. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, all of us are in a similar but far worse predicament than the groom. 
Friends, a lawsuit is not our greatest worry. If we die without Christ, we die apart from Him, friends, we will spend eternity without Him in a place called hell. And it's not a correctional facility that you go for a while and you get out of. Okay? But Christ offers us salvation freely through His sacrificial death. He says, come to me and I will give you eternal life. His sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection, friends, is sufficient for all to come to salvation, but is only efficient for those who trust Him by faith. Friends, if you have not trusted Christ by faith, I beg you, do so today. Come to know Him as Lord and Savior, and have your eternity set and your life transformed here. But what do we often do? We think, if I just do enough good things, if I'm just a good person, God will accept me, friends. The problem is that that is a lie from the pit of hell. We are guilty before a perfect and holy God. But Jesus has provided abundantly for our salvation. Do not turn to your works, your water pots for purification instead, friends. Turn to Jesus. Who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man come to the Father except through me. And he promises that he will make you a new creation. Much like we see in those stone jars. Finally, it points to the overwhelming grace of God. The overwhelming grace of God. Grace, friends, means unmerited favor. Remember the massive amount of wine that Jesus miraculously produced an overabundance, a massive amount. Jesus lavished on that celebration. And friends, that's what he's done to us. If you are a believer here today, and you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he has lavished his grace and his mercy upon you. 1 John 3, verse 1. Says, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. Some of your translations will say, lavish upon us, that we could be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Friends, based upon this love that we have received in Christ, we can have true peace, true hope. Not, not wishful thinking, but true hope in the future. That no matter what happens in this life, when we leave this place and go to the next, we are secure in Him. And we have an inheritance that is undefiled, uncorrupted, and will be kept in heaven for you. We are secure in the one who holds the future, if you have Jesus Christ. And not based on our merits, but friends, on His unmerited favor of us. So friends, I ask you this morning, have you truly been washed clean? Have you received this transformation that Christ provides? Are you seeking works to save you? Have you been relying on your own good deeds? Friends, put those things away and come to Him for eternal life and transformation. In the book of Revelation, we read about two different cups. In Revelation 19, it says this, it says, Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters, and like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah! Because our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give Him glory. Because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has prepared herself. She will be given fine linen to wear, bright and pure. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Bright, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Are you in that group? Or are you in the one written in Revelation 14? It says in another, A third angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, basically anybody who rejects Jesus, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath which is poured out full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and the sight of the Lamb. So I ask you this morning, which cup are you drinking from? Jesus came to save you. Our praise band's going to come. We're going to sing a song of reflection. If you have never come to Jesus, 
May today be the day of salvation. I'm going to be down here with my microphone on. Brother Scott's going to be over here with his uh, no microphone on. Just come. Come down the aisle. Say, I want to know more about following Jesus. What does it mean to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? If that's you this morning, would you come? Stand and sing. They should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, and they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God. Amen. So this morning, we are going to transition into a time of baby dedication. I'm going to call the Rice family forward. It's my great joy to introduce them to you this morning. And uh, if you don't know, husband and father is Andrew, and, and wife and mother is JD. And this is their beautiful daughter, Cora Jane Rice. Look at that bow. It's so sweet. <laughs> and she was born June 25th, 2024. And they have come today to pledge themselves before God and this congregation to raise this child in a way that honors the Lord. Amen. And so, I'm going to ask you guys a series of questions, okay? And just respond with, we do, all right? Do you today recognize that children are a gift of God and give heartfelt thanks for God's blessing? We do. Do you now dedicate Cora to the Lord in the hope that she will belong wholly to God? We do. Do you pledge as parents that with God's fatherly help, you will bring Cora up in the discipline instruction of the Lord, making every reasonable effort with patience and love to build the Word of God and the character of Christ and the joy of the Lord into our life. Do you promise to provide through God's blessing for the physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual needs of your little one? 
Will you constantly look to your own Heavenly Father for wisdom, love, and strength? We do. Do you promise to make it your regular prayer that by God's grace your child will come to trust, trust Jesus alone for forgiveness of her sins? We do. All right. Amen. Now, congregation, I have two questions for you as well. Okay? And you just respond, we will. All right? If this is true. Will you offer your ongoing love, support, prayers, and encouragement to Andrew and J.D. in their role as Cora's parents? Amen. Yeah. Will you also be faithful in praying for Cora? And as much as you are able, help teach and set a godly example for her so that she might one day come to trust Christ as her Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. I'm going to pray, and then we have a couple of gifts for you, okay? Let's pray. Cora, together with your parents and who love you dearly and this people who care about you deeply, we dedicate you this morning to the Lord. Lord, we ask you to walk with her all the days of her life in the hope that she will follow you all of her days and be a testimony of your wondrous works. It's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. Amen. And so we have a few things here for you. And uh, like I said, I got the wrong size frame. <laughs> Pastors, what are you going to do? And, uh, but here we have a baby dedication certificate to you. Here's the family on this date. And sign. It has a spot for your signatures as well. We also have a baby Bible here in pink. First Bible here. Uh, right there. Okay. And then probably my favorite thing here. And I'm really excited about this. I kind of want to do one of these for Paxton. It's really cool. But uh, let me open this up here. But here it says, dedicated. I will know his touch in my hands and his love in my heart. And they can put baby handprints in there, so, uh, so, uh, so uh, let's just give a round of applause. We're so excited to walk through you with this journey with you guys and to meet your church family and to support you in raising, raising your own by the way. Okay. You guys are going to stay up here. I want everyone to come by and, and congratulate them uh, on your way out today. Does that sound good? Okay, so before that, though, a few quick announcements. Please keep the family of Bill Lyon Cooler in your prayers as he passed away this last week unexpectedly. Um, services will be here tomorrow from uh, visitation 930 to 11 and then service at 11. Okay, so I'd love to see as many of us here as possible for that event. Um, and then also, um, Michelle Twiggs' mother passed away uh, later this week as well, so please keep her in your prayers as well. Okay. Um, check out the bulletin if you can grab one get on the way out. There's nothing too crazy uh, announcement-wise this week. But uh, as we close this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, just a wonderful day in the Lord's house. Lord, you bless the children. And Lord, we're so thankful for Cora and this wonderful family to rise from. Father, we just pray that um, you would be with them, that you would go out and give them strength and uh, wisdom in the days ahead as they seek to raise their little one in the fear and admonition of you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.